Well, greetings everybody. I hope that you're having a marvelous day. And if you might hear some noise out in the background here, the uh, non-believers are out there celebrating their 4th of July festivities. Anyway, uh, I did get my book in. I finally did. And uh, what I'd like to cover today is about uh, the law, the curse of the law. Uh, what the law was actually written for, why we should keep the law. <laughs> you know, a lot of people are still wondering, you know, if we should and what it does. And of course, you know, I keep getting hit with people saying, well, you believe that the law will save you. And it's nothing like that at all. I hope you can see this. This is uh, the book I just got in. It's a woman's dictionary, Symbols and Sacred Objects. Uh, I've actually owned this book several times. And there's something in here that I really need to disclose to you. And it's about grace. If I could find it here. I guess I'll have to go to the index or the back here to find it so please bear with me like you just seen I just opened the package up so we've got giant uh, gold graces here we are graces 266 All right, as you can see here, that is what grace is. The graces. The graces are. And uh, what it states in here, and once again, this is the Woman's Dictionary of uh, Symbols and Sacred Objects. And it says, The conventional image of the three naked graces, in parentheses, charities, the center one, with her back to the observer, occurs again and again throughout Greek and Roman art. The similar figures are even found carved on Hindu temples. It is apparently one of the most popular pictures of the triple goddess. All three of her aspects, seen as beautiful, joined together as one, like all divine trinities. Classic names of the graces were Agalia, meaning brilliant, uh, Thalia, meaning flowering, and Euphorensne, something like that, heart's joy. They had older names, uh, Pasithea, Kale, and Euphorosine, which were really nothing but a title of Aphrodite, whose attendants they were. Pistel, pis, pis, uh, P A S I T H E A. Kale and uh, Euphorosine, the goddess of joy, who is beautiful to all. Aphrodite, too, was once a trinity. Paucian said her charities or graces were worshipped at uh, Ocho Monios in the form of three very ancient standing stones that were said to have fallen from heaven. Homer mentioned only two graces, Pestithea and Kale, that's C-A-L-E, who seem to have personified the seasons, which the Athenians knew as two goddesses, Thalo and Carpho, sprouting and withering. Two graces were worshipped in Athens under the names of Oxo and hegemon increase and in mastery but you know the names keep changing just like satan's name keeps changing you know from lilith to hillil to you know the dragon all different kinds of names satan has even the jesus is a, a name for it. but anyway it says in any event the charities were very old the charis or grace they bestowed was the gift of the goddess beauty kindness love tenderness 
pleasure, creativity, artistry, and sensuality. The scene of this word was much changed when it was incorporated into the New Testament as uh, caritas, C-A-R-I-T-A-S, the quantity greater than faith or hope, 1 Corinthians 13. It is translated sometimes love and sometimes charity, the latter based on the Christian, early Christian belief that one could buy one's way into heaven by giving charity to the poor, the sensual and joyful implications of the goddess grace were quite lost. But once again, this is what was put into the scriptures instead of uh, pardon and acquittal. You can be pardoned and have an acquittal from your sins. That's what our king's blood will do for you eventually when you do get introduced to our king by the schoolmaster. Now, I wanted to bring that part out about grace because there's so many people that depend on grace. They think that, you know, with grace is what you're going to get salvation from. But our Heavenly Father told you straight out, and we'll get to that here shortly, you know, where our Father's going to tell you, you know, that you're not to have and have a God before him. You shall have no God before me, says the Father in Exodus 20, verse 3. Now, they did add the word other there to make it sound as though our Heavenly Father was a God, and he never was a God. But if you're counting on the graces to give you a lap dance, you know, they danced naked together. Uh, it was mistranslated by the Greeks who used the graces to define what pardon and acquittal was. And I've explained before, you know, that there was no pardon, there was no acquittal in the Greek law. When you was guilty, you was guilty. That was it. Uh, you didn't get a pardon. You didn't get an acquittal. There was no way out of it. You had the punishment, and it was coming swiftly upon you swiftly. But anyway, Revelations here in uh, 12, verse 9, it says, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. Satan has deceived the entire world. Everyone in the world is deceived. We all called on graces at one time, but we've got to overcome these things. We need to stop doing it. And then again, you know, it talks about so many people out there thinking they're going to be raptured. And, uh, you know, they, the Christians like saying that, you know, the dragon's going to make war with them. And it, it's simply not true. Here in Revelation 12, 17, it says, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and she went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments. <laughs> okay, so the Christians, you know, they're already of Satan the devil. So Satan's not going to go make war against her own people. She's going to be coming to make war against those that are of our Heavenly Father. We can put that down. Okay, so what I do want to also show as far as deception, I mean how deeply we've been deceived, even in the schools that we went to. Uh, we've been brought up, you know, some of us thinking that there's this evolutionist, you know, theory of evolution by Darwin there, you know, as if, you know, uh, these animals are smarter than we are. I mean, we've got scientists trying to create life right now. Uh, they say that it was taking millions of years for them to evolve into one little aspect and another million years to involve, you know, to, to something else, you know. But how did they maintain their life for millions of years while developing because they thought about it? Oh, wow, we should have children. <laughs> Grasshoppers and such, you know, and, and frogs and fish. And, and they're all thinking, hey, we should have offspring, <laughs> So they had to figure out a way over millions of years to develop a penis and a vagina 
and then all the other parts to make them work to bring forth new life, you know? I mean, the evolutionists are those that are deceived. You just talked about in Revelation 12, verse 9. But we're all further DC because I want you to see part of this video here. I'm using for educational purposes, and it was sent to me by our brother, uh, Shul Shane, down in uh, Texas. And uh, it was 10, 15 years ago, I believe it was, that I was driving down the road with my children. And <laughs> boy, I put the brakes on, almost went off the road. I got them all out the van. and. I'm like, look at the sun, look at this. And they're like, wow, there's it's in the clouds, <laughs> you know. The sun was in the clouds. Here we've been told, you know, our whole lives that this, you know, the sun and the moon, you know, the moon is millions of miles away, but the sun is millions and millions and millions of miles away. And it simply isn't true. Our Heavenly Father even said in Genesis chapter 1, that he created the uh, the sun and the moon. You know, one to rule the day, one to rule the night. The moon actually makes its own light. The sun doesn't illuminate the moon, my friends, you know, and I've got a lot of criticism for that. But even with the new moon, you know, when it first shows a crescent, it's like the sun set five or ten minutes before you can actually start seeing the crescent, which means that the sun should have illuminated the moon fully if it was the sun that illuminated the moon, but it's not. The sun has its light and so does the moon, and they're in the firmament. That's where they're located is in the firmament. So with that, we're going to watch a little bit of this video, and my children, like I say, they were freaked out. Uh, they didn't do too well in school afterwards because they they realize they've been lied to by many teachers and you know it, it it's an awful thing to be lied to by everybody you know but that's what you find out when you do wake up now I hope this will wake some of you up that uh, have never seen this before but start paying attention I was out in the yard here in uh, New York with my older brother and my younger brother. And I was discussing these things and my little brother started making fun of me. And wouldn't you know it, we could see the moon and we could see the sun. It was, you know, one of those days that you could see them both. And the moon was in the clouds in one part and the sun was in the clouds in the other. And my little brother's jaw just dropped, but he couldn't bring himself to admit that he actually saw it. You know, my sister-in-law saw it, my brother saw it, my brother David, you know, and uh, his bride all saw it. I saw it, I pointed it out, but some people, they, they can see it and they'll just deny it just the same. They choose to be deceived. So please watch a little bit of this with me. Three million miles away. I think not. I saw the setup occurring in the uh, cloud patterns from where I was, knowing that tonight would be very likely spectacular to illustrate the placement of the sun in the clouds. I mean, that's quite amazing, my friends. And you know, if you go up on top of a mountain or a high hill, and you look at the sun, it's going to be a whole lot bigger. The same thing with the moon, it's going to be a whole lot bigger. Uh, just by going up a few hundred feet or a few thousand feet, where if these were actually millions of miles away, a few thousand feet wouldn't even matter. It wouldn't increase the looks of the sun to be larger or anything of that sort. So, just another thing, just to prove to you we've been deceived. The sun isn't that far away. It really isn't. So let's get into what the law brings a curse, okay? There's a lot of people that say, oh, I don't want to do the law because it's a curse. It's a curse to you if you keep it. It's not what it's saying. It actually says you're cursed if you break it. Okay, here in Galatians 3.10, for instance, it says, For as many as are the works of the law are under the curse for it is written 
cursed is everyone who does not continue. You see that part of the curse? Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. <laughs> so you're cursed if you do not continue in these words that are in the Holy Scriptures. You must live by every word. Matthew 4.4 4 speaks of that. Our king said, you can't live by me alone. You can't live by bread alone. And our king was the bread of life. You cannot live by the king alone. You can't just say, oh, I believe in the Jesus and think you're going to have salvation. It's quite the contrary, okay? There's more things you need to do, like prove yourself uh, and to learn to love your brother. Because if you're stealing from somebody, you're not loving them. If you're lying about them, you're not loving them. If you tell stories about them behind their back, you don't love them. You're murdering them. You're a murderer. But anyway, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. The whole book is law. <laughs> but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of Yahweh is evidence. For the just shall live by faith. And we've discussed this in several videos over and over again, but we're going to do it again. It says, yet the law is not of faith. See, the law is not of faith. You need to have this faith. It says, but the man who does them shall live by them. Yahshua has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So you can see our king wasn't nailed to no stinking rugged cross. He was hung on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in the Messiah. That we might receive the promise of spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak, I speak in the manner of men. Though it is only a man's covenant, yet. If it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Now Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Yahshua. And this I say, that the law, which was 430 years later. Now this is talking about 430 years after Father Abraham, the laws of the temple were added to the laws. That's what he's speaking of, and that's the ones that were basically annulled afterwards because there's no temple, so you don't have the Levitical priesthood and the laws that pertain to them and how they are to do sacrifices and burn the incense and all these things. That's the law that he's speaking of here. And this I say, that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by Yahweh and Yahshua, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer a promise, but Yahweh gave it to Ad, uh, Abraham by promise. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of sin, because of transgression, because men would sin. That's what the law is for. It's, the law is not for a righteous per person, because if you're righteous, you're, you're keeping the every living word. And you don't have to worry about the law. It becomes second nature to you when you come under that covenant. But what purpose then does the law serve? And this is Galatians 3.19. It was added because of transgression till the seed, our king, should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed 
through Malachim by the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator does not mediate for one only, but Yahweh is one. Is the law then against the promises of Yahweh? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has confined all under sin. See, when you get into the laws, because it's in the book of the law, that's what the Holy Scriptures are actually called, the book of the law. But the Scriptures has confined all under sin. When you start reading and seeing that you're doing things contrary to what it says you are to do, then you realize you're confined under sin. That the promise by faith in Yahshua might be given to those who believe. Who are they that believe? The ones that turn and repent from their sins here. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. You cannot understand the true faith until you've been instructed by the schoolmaster. And it says here in Galatians 3.24, Therefore the law was our tutor, and that word tutor could be also shown as uh, schoolmaster. I'm using the New King James Version. Uh, the King James Version speaks this tutor as being the schoolmaster. Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to the Messiah, that we might be justified by faith but you have to do this law you have to be obedient to it and when you become obedient to the law when you turn from your sins then it brings you to our messiah that will then justify you by the faith and it says but after the faith has come we are no longer under a schoolmaster or a tutor for you are all sons of Yahweh through faith, and you only get this faith if the schoolmaster introduces you or gives you to our king. You have to be clean enough, in other words, for our king to even, you know, pick you up. For you are all sons of Yahweh through faith in Yahshua Messiah. For as many of you as were baptized into Messiah, have put on Messiah. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Yahshua. And if you are Yahshua's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now here we see where Moshe was speaking, and he's talking about certain individuals that's going to stand up, uh, and they're, you know, some will bless the people, and some are going to curse the people. And it says, And the Levite shall speak with a loud voice, and say to all the men of Israel, Now listen to these curses, and this is from breaking the law. If you break these laws, as you'll see here, then you're going to be cursed in it. Cursed is the one who makes a carved or molded image, an abomination to the Father, the work of hands of the craftsman, and sets it up in secret. Cursed is he who treats, and this is Deuteronomy 27, 16 now, cursed is the one who treats his father or his mother with contempt. Verse 17, cursed is the one who moves his neighbor's landmark. That's stealing. Cursed is the one who makes the blind wander off the road, you know, and people used to make sport of that stuff, I'll tell you. And, and even our king talked about, let the blind follow the blind, and they'll both fall into the ditch. But, you know, here, people used to cause the blind to go off the road, falling into mud puddles and stuff, so they could get a great laugh. Uh, it's just as... You know, the same thing here would apply to you if you go into a blind man or woman's house and you move around their furniture on them. Same thing applies, though. It may be very funny to the unrighteous. These things you're going to be cursed if you do. 
Cursed is the one who perverts the justice due to the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. Cursed is the one who lies with his father's wife because he's uncovered his father's bed. Cursed is the one who lies with any kind of animal. Cursed is the one who lies with his sister, the daughter of his father, or the daughter of his mother. Cursed is the one who lies with his mother-in-law. Lies, you know, means sleeps with. Uh, has relations with. Curses the one who attacks his neighbor secretly. Curses the one who takes a bribe to slay an innocent person. Now please get this. Deuteronomy 27 verse 26. This is where this here came from. Where it talked about over here. Uh, here in Galatians 3.10 it says, For as many as are the works of the law under are under the curse, for it is written, Curse is everyone who does not continue in all things were written, were written in the book of the law to do them. They got that there in Galatians 3.10 from reading Deuteronomy 27.26. Cursed is the one who does not confirm all the words of this law by observing them. You can see that they walk hand in hand. It's just, it's not an Old Testament. It is volume one of two volumes of the book of Yahweh. Now again, when you consider grace, Exodus 20 verse 3, you shall have no gods before me. Now gods can also be goddesses. And when you call on grace, thinking that you're going to be saved because of grace, no, the goddess is not going to save you. And this is the first of the Ten Commandments. You shall have no gods before me, our Heavenly Father said. So if you've got grace that you depend on instead of our Heavenly Father by doing as he tells you and commands you to do, then you've put grace before our Heavenly Father. Please get grace out of your vocabulary. Start using the term that was originally meant, which is pardon and acquittal, okay? You can be pardoned from your sins, but the thing is you have to stop doing your sins. You, you need to turn and convert from your old and wicked, evil ways so that you can qualify for the pardon and acquittal. I don't know of anybody that's been pardoned and given an acquittal by a governor of a state or something for whatever crime they've done wherein they go right back out and do them again. You know, people don't do those things, and it's the same thing when our king, when he does forgive us for our sins, we should never turn around and do them again. Anyway, let's take a look here at Romans 10, verse 14. It says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him? whom they have not heard, and how shall they hear without a preacher? This is what's been taking place ever since 325 AD when they killed off all the true believers. And they're explaining this, you know, how could they even understand these things unless they had somebody that could tell it to them, you know, to explain it to them. This was all in the plan, and that's what these last days are for is when the 144,000 are raised up and come to the understanding, the wisdom and knowledge of the real truth and to share it with the children of the earth, those that will hear and obey as well. And it says, and how shall they preach unless they are sent? <laughs> sure, you've got plenty of preachers all over the earth today out there in the world and they're preaching up a storm every first day or every Sunday, which isn't the Sabbath day, and they're out there and they're preaching up all sorts of cute and funny stories, but none of them have salvation. It's not for them. They were not sent, but they'll be out there, you know, preaching about a lot of lies, but they're not sent to preach the truth. It wasn't given to them. It says, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the glad tidings of peace who bring glad tidings of righteous things. But they have not all obeyed the glad tidings, for Isaiah says, Yahweh, who has believed our report? 
See, Isaiah was one of those that came preaching, and if people listened to him, they could acquire salvation. When there was prophets sent and on the earth in those days, as our Father had sent them, there was a door of salvation that was open to anyone who would believe. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Yahweh. Now this word, the word again, is the law. This is part of the word. Faith comes by hearing, and when you hear, you do what you believe, and then the hearing by the word of Yahweh. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. Their sound is gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, did Israel not know? First Moshe says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. But to Israel, he says, all the day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Here in 1 Timothy 1 verse 9, it says, Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the unrighteous and for sinners, for the unholy and profane for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers. And if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious glad tidings of the blessed Father, which was committed to my trust. This is what the law was made for. It wasn't made for the righteous. The righteous has no need for the law because they're going to live according to the every written word. They don't need the law anymore. They're doing it. They're keeping it perfectly by coming into the covenant. When you keep the laws, you are given to our king by the schoolmaster, which is the law. Then the king gives you faith. Until then, you don't even have the true faith until our king gives it to you. But then you're no longer under the schoolmaster because it's first nature to you. You know you're not going to do anything against it, and you're going to be born of our Heavenly Father. And it says, those that are born again, those that are born of the Father, cannot sin. <laughs> It's not in them to sin anymore. They have no desire for sin whatsoever. They've turned from it. Here in Galatians 3.15, it says, Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant. If ye be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and to seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Messiah. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before Yahweh and the Messiah, the law, that's what this covenant is, it's the law, which was 430 years later, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more promise, but Yahweh gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by holy Malachim in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but Yahweh is one. Is the law then against the promises of Yahweh? Yahweh forbid! For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise of Yahshua might be given to them that believe. And believe what? That you're not to sin any longer. 
Here it says in Hebrews 10, verse 26, it says, For if we sin willfully, if we sin willfully, if we know that the law says not to even touch the unclean thing, and yet you're going to eat pork or, you know, clams or oysters or, you know, whatever it is that you desire to eat or even wear, you know, a, a purse made out of alligator hide, you know, or alligator hide boots or ostrich boots or these unclean things, putting on pork skin gloves, that is a willful sin. If you know that the law says not to even touch it, and you're eating it or you're wearing it, you're sinning willfully. And it says right here, for if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, of the law, of the light, <laughs> After we have received the knowledge of the truth, if we sin willfully after that, then there remains, then no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Our, our king only died for you once. He's not going to keep dying over and over and over for you while you still choose to walk into sin and thinking that you're going to be forgiven for it, you're not. And it says here in Hebrews 10, 27, but a, fear, a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moshe's law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses of how much more punishment, how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of Yahweh underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant that ratified the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, or even an unclean thing, and insulted the spirit of pardon and acquittal. For he, uh, for we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says Yahweh. And again, the Father will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living Father. But recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, after you came to this great understanding, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, and it comes on everybody. Our king even said that if you were not chastised, then you're a bastard and you're not a son at all, or a daughter. Hebrews 10.33, partly while you were made a spectacle by both reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me and my chains, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your storages and such, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of Yahweh, you may receive the promise the will of our Heavenly Father. And what is that will? Like it says, you know, uh, while he was still talking to multitudes, behold, his mother and brothers stood outside seeking to speak with him. This is in Matthew 12, verse 46, 12, 47 now. Then one said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you. But he answered and said to the one who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. And the will of our Father, read about it, you know, it's all over in Exodus and everything, where our Father's will was for you to obey. His will was for the children to obey. And he made a covenant with them, the same as they broke, as it says here in Hebrews 8.8. 8. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says Yahweh, 
when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Yada, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant. They didn't continue in the covenant. They didn't further into it. And I disregarded them, says Yahweh. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says Yahweh. And what's it say? I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. And you only get this done by practicing. When you do the will of our Father, it becomes a first nature, not even a second nature. It becomes first nature. You're not going to stick your thumb in the door frame and slam a door on it. You know, you know that that's not going to be too cool to do. So there's not even a first thought that comes to your mind to do such a thing. That's what the laws do. When you see something doesn't belong to you, you might pick it up so it don't get ruined and, you know, put it somewhere for them when they come back looking for it. But you're not going to steal it and find, you know, uh, losers, weepers, finders, keepers sort of thing. That's not according to this law. Making your brother cry or weep over something that they lost and you're enjoying and you didn't do anything but find it. You know, you take advantage of your brother because he lost it, but... Our father said, I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts and I will be their father and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother saying, do you know Yahweh or do you know Yahshua? For all shall know them <laughs> from the least of them to the greatest of them because once you get brought to our king and given over to our king by the schoolmaster, our king teaches you personally. It's the only way that I know what I know. <laughs> I know nothing else but what our king has led me to come to understand. I know our king because I keep the commandments. First Yachinon chapter 2, 3 through 6 tells you, if you say you know him and you do not keep his commandments, you're a liar. So if you do say you know him and you do keep his commandments, then you do know him. And he teaches you, he leads you through the Holy Spirit to doing everything that he chooses you to do for whatever his purpose is. And we're a body of members, you know. Everyone's not a finger. Everyone's not a, a nose hair, you know. We're a hair and a head. Not everybody's a foot. Not everybody's an eyeball. Each of us are being brought up for specific purposes to fulfill the body of our king in these last days for when he returns. And that's the importance of these laws, that, that we all come into unity, that we partake in the will of our Father so we can be brothers and sisters, and that our Father will put his laws in our mind and in our hearts. For I will be merciful. Uh, well, it says here, None of them shall teach his neighbor, and none of their brothers saying, Do you know Yahweh or Yahshua? For all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. Our Father isn't a respecter of persons, but he does respect those who keep his law. And it says so. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. Yes, he's going to give you a pardon for what you've done wrong and their sins and their lawless deeds. Yes, he's going to give you an acquittal where otherwise you were supposed to die. <laughs> I will remember no more because he's given you a pardon and acquittal once you overcome your sins and you don't do them again. Our king said, go and sin no more. <laughs> Everybody he healed and such, even to the woman that he... Uh, he kind of rescued because the uh, wicked ones that were bringing her and not the man to before him, saying that she was caught in the very act of adultery and yet they only brought the woman. Well, our king couldn't have no part to do with that. It was a test on him. And he knows the law said you had to bring them both. And they were both to be stoned, but they only brought the woman. Hebrews 8.13, in that he says a new covenant... He has made the first obsolete. 
Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. But we've got the new covenant, which is by the blood of our king it was enacted. My friends, the law is of the utmost importance. You cannot have, you know, it's not going to be what gives you salvation. In fact, our king is only going to give salvation unto who he is going to give salvation unto. You cannot even go to our king, you know, without him choosing you. You cannot choose our king. Our king chooses us. And those that are chose, if we believe the every word and we learn the house rules, why, absolutely, our king will give us that free gift of salvation. He's going to, you know, forgive us. He's going to give us a pardon. And he's going to give us an acquittal from the sins we did in our past. But we have to learn the house rules so that we never... It says that there's not going to be any more tears, no more sorrow, no more crying. None of these things is going to take place because no sin is going to be allowed in the kingdom. Which means no one's going to break the laws. The law doesn't bring salvation. Okay, It brings us to our king. The law is the schoolmaster, brings us to the king, and in exchange for our understanding and walking in the law, our king then trades that law in for the faith. And the faith is the belief in our king and our heavenly father, and to trust in them only. <laughs> so I hope you can understand these things. I hope I didn't go too far overboard with this, but I do have a new editor program. Uh, my other one, the uh, reason I said I've never edited before is because it never worked. <laughs> no matter how many times I tried, it just didn't work. And uh, this here is what I'm making videos on now. I can actually, you know, put my face wherever I want into these videos. Uh, then I can go ahead and I've got a new program here as well. This is the Wondershare Filmora uh, 9, and it costs like $50, you know, that I spent as a gift for you all, hopefully, to be able to bring more of these uh, marvelous words to y'all. So with that, my friends, I do want to say I love you all. I'm hoping that uh, you'll consider the words that are written within the book. Uh, I hope that you'll consider the words that I've used to help describe the words that were written in the book, and to no longer be deceived. Let's come out from the deception. The sun is not millions and millions of miles away. It's not all that far from us, uh, believe it or not. <laughs> it's in the firmament. The same thing with the moon. So with that, uh, Sabbath has been a blessing so far. I'm kind of getting tired, but I know i got to do some editing here. I had me a pretty big meal I uh, was getting pretty uh, <laughs> flustered. My stomach was hurting because I was having such a problem with this here programming, this OBS. It really was messing up on me, and it looked like uh, one of those Infinity Boxes, a uh, Tetris game or whatever, where it, everything was just going -doo 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 for infinity all the way into the computer, and I'm like, oh, man, and, and I had to uh, delete it and... Uh, reboot it, you know, uh, uh, re-download it, and I, I did that like 15 times before I finally got everything completely deleted so I could come back and get this here to where it works. So with that, my friends, <laughs> I'm going to do some editing, and I love y'all. May the peace of our King be with you, each and every one of you who choose to do their will, which is living by the every living word. And the law is part of it, and so is the commandments. Bye.